Right, uh, welcome everyone to the CS seminar. Um, today we have Sangeeta Abdul-Jyoti uh, presenting um, her research to us today. She's a new assistant professor, uh, really exciting stuff. She's been working a lot in um, computer networking and systems and most excitedly, especially for me, she's been doing a lot of cool machine learning stuff as well. Um, she did her PhD from UIUC and spent a year at VMware, so she has a nice mix of academia and industry. Um, so yeah, uh, Sangeeta, please go ahead and take over. Yeah, so hi everyone, I'm Sangeeta. I'm very happy to be uh, um, part of the department and thanks for inviting me for having this talk. So today I'll be talking about DNA training acceleration through better communication computation overlap. So growing interest in deep learning has led to the emergence of a variety of deep learning frameworks, such as PyTorch, TensorFlow, MXNet, and so on. Independent of these underlying platforms, uh, deep learning workloads share a common set of characteristics. Training of a deep neural network or a DNN is an iterative workload. So the goal here is to learn a model with a set of parameters that represents the input data. And this is done through uh, iterative optimization. Uh, large input data sets are divided into batches and during an iteration, one such batch is fed to a worker. Uh, these iterations are identical uh, that is, the same set of computations are often uh, performed over each batch of data and uh, updates to parameters are computed. Now, this workload is both compute and network intensive. State-of-the-art models in um, domains like vision and NLP have millions to billions of parameters uh, that are updated after every iteration. Uh, so gigabits a worth of parameters need to be aggregated across workers after each iteration. So today in this uh, talk, first I'll give a brief overview of the distributed training environment, and then uh, discuss the importance of uh, computation communication overlap in this setting. And then I'll uh, uh, briefly describe two systems that we built which addresses this, which address this challenge under two different uh, network aggregation patterns, parameter server and all reduce. Uh, so I would like to make it clear that this is a very networking and systems perspective of DNN training workload. Uh, in both these systems, uh, we improve the iteration time through uh, just network and compute scheduling uh, without affecting the correctness of training. And finally, I'll give a very brief overview of other ongoing projects that I have um, uh, that will be at the end. So let's get started with, uh, the dist uh, with a brief overview of, a dis of the distributed training setting. So in most platforms today, the distributed training workload is typically represented using a computational DAG or a directed acyclic graph. The training has two phases, forward pass and back propagation. So at the beginning of an iteration, a batch of input data is fed to the computational model. Now, using the latest version of parameters, a loss function is computed. So here we have a toy example. Uh, here, ops one to four are the computation operations with dependencies between them specified using the directed links. A to D are parameters which are used by various computation operations. In the, in the back propagation phase, uh, based on the loss, the parameters are updated. So here we can see that in the computational DAG, uh, the forward pass and back propagation are in the DAG are, are often mirror images of each other. And here we have a single iteration of the DNN training. Here we can see that uh, every parameter is required by some computation operation 
and it is updated by the mirror image of that operation in the back propagation phase. So the window between the read and the updated operations of a given parameter is the duration in which the parameter is used by the model and manipulated by the training process. So this is the interval where the parameter value cannot be changed. And we refer to this as the no synchronization window. And here each parameter has its own uh, no synchronization window based on the location of the compute operations that read and update this parameter. And uh, we can also see that in the DAG, the parameter that is consumed first, so here parameter A, is typically updated uh, at the end, uh, uh, last, because of the nature of the underlying computation. And again, this is the uh, this is a single iteration of computation from a single worker's perspective when the complete DAG is available at a single worker. Now, in, in a distributed setting, this computational DAG can be distributed in multiple ways across multiple workers. So uh, let's assume this pentagon represents the computational DAG that I showed you earlier. And we need to distribute this across four workers. So there are several ways in which the DAG can be distributed. The first mode is called uh, the data parallel or the model replica mode, where the entire DAG is available at all the workers. The second mode of distribution is model parallel mode, where the input DAG is divided across multiple workers. Finally, we have the hybrid mode, which is a combination of data parallel and model parallel modes. So in this talk, uh, we'll be focusing on uh, the data parallel mode, which is one of the most popular mode of distribution. And here, every worker has a complete copy of the DAG. So in data parallel mode, each worker has a complete copy of the DAG and independently computes updates to the parameters based on its input data, batch of data in that iteration. So at the end of the iteration, we need to aggregate these updates across multiple workers. Now, this can be done in two ways. The first one is the parameter server mode. So let's focus on a single parameter update here, parameter A. So each worker has, a, has its local update to parameter A. And in parameter server-based aggregation, all the workers send their local updates to a parameter server. So the parameter server receives updates from all workers, and then it aggregates the uh, parameter, and then sends the updated version to all uh, back to all the workers. So here the parameter server will be logically centralized with multiple distributed nodes handling the parameter server function. And uh, another thing to note here is that each parameter is aggregated independently. Now, this is the first mode of aggregation. Uh, the second mode is decentralized aggregation, where we don't have a centralized aggregation location like a parameter server. Instead, instead the workers form overlay patterns for aggregation. And the most common mode used today is ring all reduce where the workers form a ring pattern and uh, every node communicates with two other nodes. So the parameter that needs to be aggregated is partitioned and aggregated uh, 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 on a with multiple iterations. So these are the two modes of network aggregation. So we have seen the patterns of computation distribution as well as patterns of parameter aggregation in the network. So next we'll see the importance of communication computation overlap in this workload. So to understand this better, uh, we ran a simple experiment using data parallel training with four workers and uh, parameter server based aggregation on TensorFlow uh, using Inception V3, a popular model. So here we have network and compute traces at four workers. Uh, and this is captured over a single iteration. So here we can see that um, in workers two and 
four, uh, the computation starts very early, like the traces in blue. But uh, but if we look at worker one, it is receiving network updates right from the beginning, just like workers two and four. But uh, but the computation doesn't start until much later. So worker one's blocked computation is effectively increasing the iteration time. Also, uh, so they, they we have block computation. Also, even though worker four starts early and finishes the computation early, the parameters cannot be aggregated until all workers finish. So the global iteration cannot move forward uh, until the stragglers finish as well. So the iteration is blocked by these straggling workers like worker one. And we see that, uh, so this increased iteration time is caused by uh, a mismatch in overlap of communication and computation across workers. And here, another thing to note here is that all the workers are running the same DAG and receiving the same set of uh, parameter updates from the parameter server. Still, there is a mismatch. So here it's clear that it, we can improve the iteration time if there is a good overlap of communication and computation at all workers. Uh, uh, but in order to do that, uh, we need to understand the cost for this discrepancy. So we found that the cost uh, for this discrepancy is a random order of parameter transfers that happen from the parameter server. So this is our toy example from earlier slide. So here we can see that in this DAG, operation one, which is the first operation in the DAG, requires parameter A. So the computation uh, cannot start uh, until parameter A is received. But the problem is that all these deep learning platforms gave a lot of emphasis to compute scheduling, GPU and CPU scheduling, and mostly overlooked the network scheduling part. So the parameter server sends the parameters back to the workers in random order without, uh, without, any, uh, without considering this computational tag. So uh, as a result, parameters B, C, or D, which is consumed later in the DAG, uh, maybe uh, transferred before A. This blocks computation. And to make things worse, parameters that are updated last are consumed first. So there's a greater chance for other parameters to be sent earlier. So this is the reason for random start time of computation across workers that we saw earlier. And this happens because the parameter server is not aware of the computation tag at workers. So uh, today we're presenting two systems that uh, address this challenge uh, and improve DNN training attrition time by improving communication computation overlap um, through network and compute scheduling. So there are, there are multiple ways in which uh, DNN training can be accelerated. And uh, both the systems that I'm presenting today will focus on improving communication computation overlap. Uh, TIC-TAC focuses on network scheduling in the parameter server mode of aggregation. And uh, Caramel focuses on compute scheduling in the all reduced setting. Uh, so there are other techniques that improve DNN training time by either increasing the computation time or decreasing communication time. Uh, since network is often the bottleneck. So this is uh, the broad uh, space of work um, in this uh, domain. So let's start with uh, TIC-TAC, which is a system for accelerating distributed deep learning uh, with communication scheduling in um, the parameter server setting. Uh, this is joint work with Said Hadi Hashimi and Roy Campbell at UIUC. So feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So the goal here is uh, to improve the iteration time through better communication computation overlap 
in parameter server based aggregation and this is achieved by scheduling the parameter transfers at the parameter server in the order required by the workers so before delving into the details uh, i briefly introduce some mathematical notations that we use so this is our iteration time so which is composed of uh, the communication time which is represented by the n and uh, and c represent the computation time here and t is the time taken by one iteration so here we can improve t or reduce t by uh, increasing the overlap between n and c so we define uh, communication to computation ratio or rho as uh, n divided by c um, another important factor here is the overlap coefficient so here um, which is defined alpha defined as follows so here n plus c is the total iteration time if there was no overlap so n plus c minus t gives the overlap time now minimum of n and c is the maximum possible overlap so the maximum po possible overlap between these two bars is the small shorter uh, one among them so alpha which is uh, the current overlap divided by maximum possible overlap uh, captures the uh, captures how good the current overlap is given values of n and c so our goal is to maximize the compute utilization that is the c divided by t uh, uh, by improving overlap so uh, here we use these parameters alpha and rho to model compute utilization so we plot contour lines of gp utilization in terms of alpha and rho so alpha is the overlap coefficient and rho is the communication to computation ratio um, so gp utilization improves when uh, overlap is high so you want to be higher up on the y axis and communication to computation ratio is low so you want to be on the left uh, on the x axis so here we can see that uh, vanilla tensor flow this is with inception v3 and uh, uh, four workers uh, vanilla tensor flow has uh, about 75% utilization with nearly uh, 0.75 or, or 0.5 overlap so in tic tac we maintain the communication and computation time so the row does not change but we improve the iteration time by increasing the overlap so uh, we we'll, i next i'll show you how we do that so we have um, tic tac has two algorithms first is uh, timing independent communication scheduling so the goal here is to send the parameter updates in the order in which the workers require, uh, require them so tick or timing independent scheduling depends only is in the, uh, is time independent communication scheduling so we only use the underlying dag structure uh, to determine the priorities of transfers from parameter server to the workers so this is the uh, forward pass from the toy example i showed earlier so the goal here is to assign priorities to each parameter transfer based on the uh, communication operations um, that uh, each transfer is dependent on so here for example parameter a has no other transfers dependent on it it is required by the first commutation operation so it gets the first priority uh, and then both parameters b and c have one dependency uh, which is parameter a so they get the next priority too and finally d is assigned the lowest priority of 3 um, so note that here we use only the dag structure to assign these parameter uh, these priorities so the second algorithm we have is um, timing aware communication scheduling 
And here we use uh, both the DAC structure and time taken by uh, computation and communication operations uh, to determine the priority order. So the detailed algorithm uh, is in our paper. I'll give a simple example. Now, suppose all the computation operations, one to four, have the same commutation time. Now, assume each parameter transfer takes time uh, as specified here. So the goal of the algorithm is to reduce blocking on the critical path of computation to speed up computation. So again, just like before, A is the first parameter required and the computation cannot start until A is received. So it is again assigned the highest priority of one. Now for the second transfer, we have two choices. We can either send parameter B or parameter C. And they have the same number of dependent ops before them. So here we can see that transfer C takes only one millisecond and transfer B takes two millisecond. So if C is transferred first, it will allow computation operation, which is operation three, to start just after one millisecond. But if we send parameter B, operation two needs to wait two millisecond before it can start. So in this case, uh, C is the smallest blocking transfer. It allows computation to start sooner. So uh, the smallest blocking transfer, which is C, is assigned the priority to here. And then, uh, and then B is assigned priority three and then followed by B again. So here we use both the DAG structure and the uh, operation timings to determine priorities. So these are the two algorithms that we use for um, for generating the priorities of transfer. And uh, this is a high level system overview. So uh, we take as inputs the model or the computational bag. And the, in the case of timing error scheduling, we also take estimates from a tracing module. So this information is used to find the best order for parameter transfers. Uh, and we generate a priority list. And uh, we have an enforcement module which enforces the priority of transfers at the parameter server. So we test tic tac across multiple worker and parameter servers on Microsoft Azure. Azure. Uh, we evaluate iteration time improvement um, in a training setting with uh, stochastic gradient descent and in an inference setting where, where inference agents need to fetch the latest parameters from a centralized server. And we test a variety of uh, models. And uh, here are some of our performance results. So first we plot throughput gain uh, or the speed and throughput, which is samples per second as percentage, uh, comparing uh, the timing aware uh, scheduling with uh, vanilla TensorFlow here. And we use a different uh, number of workers, two, four, eight, sixteen, et cetera. And here we can see that uh, throughput improves significantly, like five to 30% with timing aware uh, scheduling uh, due to careful scheduling of parameters at the parameter server. And the improvement is higher in larger models. And um, so note that uh, even 20% improvement is very significant in the setting because these iterative workloads uh, typically run for days or weeks. So um, this is a huge improvement in iteration time. So that was um, uh, just some of the results on uh, uh, Tic Tac uh, with um, a parameter uh, server scheduling, um, uh, communication scheduling in parameter server setting. So uh, next, we discuss Caramel, which is a system that uh, uh, addresses centralized aggregation in all radio setting, where we do not have a centralized location like parameter server to enforce ordering. So we tackle the same problem in the decentralized setting using uh, computation scheduling.
So today, most platforms uh, like TensorFlow and PyTorch are moving to de uh, decentralized aggregation as the default mode for aggregation. Since uh, parameter server, server settings suffers from in-cast and outcast. So as we saw earlier, all workers are sending updates for a given parameter to the same node. So this causes uh, congestion in the network um, link at the parameter servers. So the alternative is to have collective transfer uh, and the most common uh, mode of collective transfer is ring all radius. So I'll give a very brief overview of how ring all radius works. So uh, the worker nodes uh, communicate with each other in a ring pattern. Uh, the updates that need to be aggregated are divided into chunks uh, and the aggregation proceeds in uh, multiple iterations. Um, so each, each worker uh, divides its parameter update into chunks and during each iteration, uh, one chunk is um, sent to the neighbor. And here, uh, note that each neighbor is, uh, each worker is sending a different chunk. So W1 sends A0, W2 sends B1, and so on. And then uh, the neighbor aggregates that chunk and then forwards it to the next node. And then, uh, and then the receive chunk is again aggregated. And this proceeds in multiple rounds. So here, finally, after six rounds, which is uh, two times the number of workers minus one uh, rounds, we have aggregated the parameter at all workers. So this is a high level overview of how ring all radius works. So um, Caramel is a system that um, uh, accelerates uh, this decentralized distributed uh, deep learning training using computation scheduling. So uh, in the all radius setting, we have a different set of challenges, uh, which I'll first um, briefly discuss here. So first, uh, unlike, um, unlike in the parameter server, where workers can send updates as soon as they are ready, uh, here all workers should have the parameters ready for transfer before the aggregation can begin because this is happening in a decentralized fashion, the parameters need to be ready beforehand. So, uh, so the, and the parameter updates happen in the back propagation phase. So in all radius today, uh, the parameter aggregation can only happen in the back propagation phase. So, but when we look at uh, a bunch of popular models, we observe that um, the forward pass takes 20 to 40% of the iteration time. Hence, um, network transfers are currently not allowed during thir nearly 30% of the iteration time. So, uh, so this is, so a significant chunk of the time cannot be used for network transfers currently. The second challenge is again, random order of parameter activation that we saw earlier in parameter server. So unlike in TIC-TAC where we could set the order of transfers at the parameter server, uh, here uh, randomness arises from the different order of execution in the DAG. So a given DAG um, may allow several feasible next ops of operations after a given operation. So for example, uh, here after op Four dash in the DAG, we can execute either op two dash or op three dash, and both are valid based on the constraints given by the DAG. So, if we execute op two dash first, we have parameter B ready for aggregation first, and if we execute op three dash first, we have parameter C ready for aggregation first. And the aggregation can be done only when the parameter is ready at all workers. Now, some workers may ha choose to execute two dash first and some others may choose to execute three dash first. And as a result, uh, the activations will be in random order. So, and the all radius can start only after when uh, a given parameter is ready at all, all workers. 
So this will cause um, uh, unnecessary delays uh, across workers for waiting for parameter activation at other workers. So this is a problem in all reduced setting as well. Now, a third challenge that we found in all reduced setting um, arises from system overheads associated with uh, transferring small parameters. So uh, we looked at a bunch of com common models and we observed that 50 to 60% of the parameters are small and here smaller than uh, 100 kilobytes. So when we benchmark the system, we see that um, the transfer time has large overheads when parameters are small. So here, uh, 100 byte transfer as well as a 100 kilobyte transfer takes nearly the same time uh, due to overheads at small sizes. So a large number of uh, small parameters can incur uh, significant overheads. So these are three main problems that we find in the all reduced setting. So uh, we improve, uh, we address these challenges with caramel uh, in, in all reduced setting uh, by addressing these issues uh, that I just mentioned. So I'll first give a high level overview of how these problems are tackled. So the first problem was uh, network underutilization. Uh, due to inability to do transfers in forward pass. So we modify the system to allow transfers in forward pass without affecting correctness. Um, the second problem was randomness in parameter updates. Uh, we don't have a centralized server here, but we can fix the order by adding additional dependencies in the computation tab. Uh, finally, we tackle the problem of uh, large overheads uh, arising from small parameters using parameter batching. So I'll discuss the first two solutions in depth and uh, our batching algorithm can be found in our paper, which is on archive. Um, so the first technique we use is scheduling in the forward pass, but we cannot simply randomly move transfers to forward pass. So let's look at a single parameter C uh, in our toy example. So before our optimization, uh, the original window of transfer for uh, scheduling C is uh, between the time the C is ready for update and the end of the iteration. Uh, so we can see that uh, in the forward pass, C is required for computation at operation three. So C is not read at the beginning of the iteration. So it's required only at op three. So this gives us an additional window for scheduling C without affecting the computation. So we only need to ensure that uh, the parameter is available before it is read. So we can move transfers to forward pass without affecting computation. And uh, each parameter has different windows based on the location in which they are read and updated. So we, this, we have a deadline based two dimensional bin packing. So the two dimensions are time and the available network bandwidth um, to effectively utilize this uh, additional window in the forward pass. So that's the first technique. The second problem was uh, uh, DAG execution variability. So we reduce variability uh, by restricting the number of possible paths in the DAG by adding uh, additional dependencies. So here note that we're not changing the underlying computation model. We are choosing one out of n possible ways of executing a given DAG. So uh, here, as we saw earlier, there are multiple feasible orders for execution after, uh, uh, say, example, after four dash, we can execute either two dash or three dash. Um, now, uh, we can, uh, we reduce the variance by adding additional dependencies. So here, for example, uh, uh, 
the and this order of dependencies is chosen uh, using a heuristic that prioritizes uh, network update activation so here for example uh, suppose 2 dash takes 1 millisecond and 3 dash takes 2 millisecond if we execute 2 dash first we have b ready for transfer earlier sooner so we want to execute the smaller computation first so in order to ensure that all workers do that all we need to do is add an additional dependency from 2 dash to 3 dash so this forces all workers to execute the uh, operation 2 dash before 3 dash uh, um, at all workers so uh, so here one thing to note is that the dag allows multiple possible ways of traversing it and we are just enforcing one of the feasible um, feasible operation in feasible order of operation from the original dag so we are not changing the correctness of the underlying dag so uh, here uh, we have a uh, comparison between um, caramel and uh, tensorflow plus mpi which is the uh, uh, which is a uh, using horovod so this is a collector transfer library and uh, tensorflow with parameter server so here we can see that tensorflow with uh, with parameter server has 75 percent utilization with inception with three on eight workers so and with uh, tensorflow and mpi using horovod uh, the GP utilization was less than 70%. But with Caramel, we are able to improve this utilization above 90%. So here, uh, unlike TensorFlow, we, uh, unlike uh, TicTac, which only improved overlap, here we can, we are also able to reduce the communication to computation ratio by reducing the communication overheads. So here I have some results on performance comparison of um, uh, Caramel with Horovod, another AR all reduce implementation, uh, and as well as parameter server implementation. So on the left, we have um, iteration time in seconds, uh, comparing these various schemes at different number of uh, workers. And on the right, we have uh, GP utilization. So in all models, uh, we see that Caramel can reduce the iteration time significantly. And, uh, and for some models, the GPU utilization can be increased close to um, 100%. So we have up to 3.8 times movement in utilization. And this is through careful uh, scheduling of um, uh, the compute operations in a manner that improve overlap between communication and computation. So, um, so here, um, so I presented two systems that address uh, poor communication computation overlap in uh, data parallel training setting under uh, two different modes of network aggregation, parameter server and all reduce. So TicTac improved performance in the parameter server setting with uh, parameter transfer scheduling. Uh, and Caramel improved uh, all reduced performance with a bunch of optimizations that reduce variability and overheads. Um, so are there any questions at this point? Let me, I'm not. This is one question about the graph that you showed a little bit ago. Uh, the, with this one? The overlap between the communication and computation, yeah. Right. Or tic tac versus tensorflow. Tic tac versus tensorflow. This one? Or, yeah, or, okay, so. or, or the first one? This one, but for tic tac. I guess, okay. I guess this one? I, I cannot see. Can you please read? Yeah. yeah. So this uh, this is the one. Yeah. Is there a question, or just you want just want to see it? Okay, that's it. Uh, there's one question from uh, Nalini. 
Uh, is there an assumption of homogeneity amongst the worker nodes and communication links? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, that is one assumption that uh, we have. Um, so yeah, so uh, in future work, handling heterogeneity is like one of the uh, things that we want to look in future. Uh, another thing is we assume that uh, currently we assume that there there are no stragglers in computation, uh, but uh, in practice. Uh, some nodes might could be slower than others so how do we handle this in real time uh, is um, like a difficult challenge because the iteration typically lasts like uh, maybe hundreds of milliseconds uh, so uh, handling um, these stragglers in computation is also another challenge uh, another direction that uh, i would like to look at in future is how can we use smart mix for all reduce so there are mul in all reduce there are multiple iteration and um, in each iteration, the chunk that is received has to be sent from the NIC to the CPU, aggregated and then sent back. But we can do some extent of uh, uh, computation on the NICs and this can reduce time significantly. So these are some uh, directions that I would like to explore in the future. Are there more questions? Uh... Not in the chat. So one question I guess I have is you're mostly talking about parallelizing the training by splitting the data and the batches in some sense. Um, but some of these models are becoming so big that there is even enough interest in splitting the model. Um, mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about that? How many of these sort of ideas would even translate there? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, so, so in um, uh, data, basically model parallel mode, um, uh, uh, the so if across uh, if if a single model is split across multiple nodes, um, then the transfers are only with the intermediate uh, kind of uh, parameters between two stages two layers. So in that case, there is nothing much to do. But if we have multiple such copies, say one model is divided into five, and there are so and there are fifty nodes. So here ten copies of the split. Uh, models, then this is still valid across across the uh, various copies. I see. I see. Okay. And I see. there are people also looking at um, uh, you know making each layer uh, take equivalent amount of time. So if one layer takes, uh, uh, so there are various ways of doing hybrid uh, uh, scheduling. So, um, yeah, so this is very an active area of research now. Yeah, especially in NLP, there's also a distribution of like the length of the inputs can also vary. Um, and mm -hmm. so even the load balancing, even if you have homogeneous uh, machines, um, it still is a, the load may not be homogeneous. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we mostly looked at vision models. Uh, there was another question. Uh, Asking to show the training time difference between Tic Tac and TensorFlow again, I guess. Mm -hmm. Also, if any of the audience have questions, just either post it on chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, so what was the question here? There's no question, just can you show the training time difference? Uh, which one is TF? Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, the throughput of TAC divided by TF uh, as percentage. And this is across two workloads, so inference and training. So orange is training workload and uh, blue is inference workload. So this is, so 20 here means uh, TAC is 20% uh, faster than vanilla TensorFlow. So zero would be uh, TensorFlow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's one question from Emily. Um, I have a question. It's on the back of the slide where you choose node C over node B because it's the difference between one second and two, one millisecond and two millisecond. Is the greedy approach okay in general? Uh, one second. Let, um... Oh yeah, this one. Yeah, so um, so the greedy approach is okay in general. So the problem here is the randomness. So if we 
uh, so once we choose one particular order that by itself reduces uh, randomness and uh, the second uh, thing is um, uh, reducing the blocking on computation so here i gave a simple example like in the actual uh, so in the paper you can um, see a more kind of systematic way in which we arrived at the uh, heuristic uh, which is a bit more complicated than this uh, so uh, so we see that uh, it works in practice it gives significantly better results in practice and uh, more than the uh, the the order that was selected based on one millisecond to based on the times what really helps is picking one definite order uh, that was the factor that improved it significantly even if the even if we changed the uh, priorities uh, the differences were much smaller uh, so the key problem there was randomness are there more questions so if there aren't more so questions i have a question this is nalini hi hi can you hear me yeah yeah okay so you mentioned that you did a lot of this work with vision based workloads right mm -hmm. where perhaps the data sizes are a bit larger what if i had very small volumes of data does that change the balance of how much aggregation how much computation how much communication um in terms of uh scheduling as well as in terms of uh, you know uh, how much to aggregate before i think it's worthwhile to do some scheduling and the associated latencies yeah so so the uh, so what is being aggregated here is the parameters so mm -hmm. the 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 low the workload compute time network time depends on the model so independent of your type of work, workload like it could be vision it could be some you know time series data um, what matters is how big your model is so if if you, whatever you're trying to learn can be learned by say a two layer network mm -hmm. then this is not of much use but whatever be the domain what you're trying to learn is very uh, has you know very complex properties and you need a large model to uh, learn the characteristics then um, then this parameter so then you have a large number of parameters and then the aggregation becomes a challenge so it depends on the model size and the number of parameters that um, you have so like a three layer small model probably this is not that big of a deal mm. so so rather than the input um uh, uh size what matters is the model size got it got it and the amount of parameters that you exchange yes thank you uh there was one more question um how are the weights distributed in every node after every iteration of backprop so uh so th that is done by either parameter server or on reduce so after the uh, uh so after back propagation every node has its own local update based on the input data uh, and then these updates are sent to the parameter server or you know aggregated using the ring and then um, the late so we we co combine updates from all workers and then um, the latest version is read by the uh, next prompt so uh, so uh, we use either parameter server or all reduce for uh, combine uh, like aggregating the uh, um, aggregating the updates uh, does that answer like uh, like whoever asked the question is that clear is that what you asked uh subamoy if you want to unmute yourself you can just oh it says yes that was the that oh. answer okay cool um i think that's all we have questions for um last yeah. chance anyone wants to unmute and ask any questions 
No? Okay. All right. So, yeah, I think. Thank you so much. I'll give you a very brief overview of uh, my other new ongoing projects. Um, so, the first one is on uh, verification and interpretability of uh, reinforcement learning based controllers. Um, so, learning based controllers are gaining traction in a variety of uh, networking and systems settings today. And uh, reinforcement learning is uh, the method of choice for control uh, in these settings. And this is because of two factors. First, it allows uh, continuous interaction with the environment. So it works well for dynamic uh, settings such as, uh, you know, such as uh, the ones in network sense systems. And, um, and recently, uh, it has been shown that RL-based controllers offer much higher performance compared to uh, manually designed heuristics that were previously used in settings like uh, congestion control, cluster scheduling, uh, load balancing, and variety of other systems control uh, tasks. Uh, but real world adoption is uh, significantly hindered, uh, although they offer high performance due to two main reasons. So first is lack of robustness guarantees. In the training setting, we saw that the controller uh, performs well, but will the controller be able to handle all the real world settings that it'll, uh, that'll, that'll face? So this is not clear um, and this is a big problem like if you have a data center with thousands of uh, servers and you need deploy an RL based controller and then if things crash it, it can have significant impact. And the second problem is uh, the black box nature. We don't know um, why uh, an RL based controller made a decision it made. So, so the goal in this project is to uh, enable practical adoption of RL based controllers in computer networks and systems uh, through better verification and interpretation capabilities. So uh, yeah, so my uh, PSC student Sagar is currently looking at this. Um, and uh, the second uh, project that I have currently is in a, 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 in a different setting, but this is not related to ML. Uh, this is about internet resilience under solar superstorms. Um, so, um, so I I was thinking about uh, kind of disaster scenarios that could affect uh, the internet, like motivated by the current COVID situation. So one such scenario is solar superstorms. So solar activity waxes and wanes in uh, cycles of uh, length of approximately eleven years. And during solar maxima, there is an increased occurrence of solar flares and uh, a phenomenon called coronal mass ejection. So solar flares are what cause auroras at you know higher latitudes, and uh, coronal mass ejections are um, highly directional magnetized particles that come out of the sun. And when it hits the Earth, it interacts with the Earth's uh, magnetic field and produce a geomagnetically induced current on the Earth's surface. So this can significantly affect long conductors on Earth's surface, such as power transmission lines, uh, internet cables, metallic oil pipelines, and so on. So internet cables are very vulnerable to GIC, but people have not really looked at the impact because uh, it happened that, so in addition to the 11 year cycle, the solar cycle also goes through a 100 year cycle. And it so happened that the past two decades were in like a low phase of uh, uh, solar activity. So uh, the largest solar event that we had was in 1859. And then we had only telegraph networks. And uh, at that time, a um, lot of the equipment were burnt. Uh, telegraph operators got electric shock uh, and uh, it caused significant damage. But in the past two decades, when the internet actually grew, we, uh, we did not have any uh, large solar events. So the goal of this uh, project is to understand the risk po posed by solar storm storms to uh, the global internet connectivity. Yeah, so I just wanted to give a brief overview of things that I'm working on currently. Um, if people are interested in talking about any of these, uh, please feel free to reach out. Um, so that's all I have. Um, thank you. If there are more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, thanks, Angita. Um, any last questions? 
in the chat. Don't see any. Um, all right. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Sangeeta. And this is great. Thank you.